Okay, move out. firepower demonstration in West Germany. German-American friendship in Berlin. A day in the life of a helicopter pilot. The combat artist at work. A search for the enemy in the lowlands of Vietnam. A flying chaplain and his jungle parish. In this issue of your Army reports. High-ranking NATO officials arrive at Grafenvor, West Germany, to witness a dramatic U.S. military demonstration. All current weapons being used in the European command are displayed and employed in a mock attack. Supplying the ground power is the job of the 4th Armored Division. Units reveal their capacity for quick response as armored personnel carriers move combat-ready troops swiftly to their destination. A jeep-mounted recoilless rifle moves into position on the firing line. Little time is lost in setting up the complex weapons of modern warfare. Heavy firepower for close support in combat defends our infantrymen against armored attack. Still, the basic weapon of the U.S. infantrymen is the shoulder-fired rifle. Newest developments in rifle technology will permit faster, more accurate firing. A formidable battle weapon is a flamethrower. Several types of tanks are demonstrated for versatility and maneuver. The 175mm track-mounted gun, the Hawk missile for low-flying enemy planes, Mortifier from an armored personnel carrier, a combination of mobility and firepower that gives great flexibility to the combat unit. The big tank guns get a workout on the firing line. Laying down rocket, machine gun fire, and napalm on the simulated enemy area, U.S. aircraft also take part in the Grafenbohr demonstration. Next, a simulated low-yield nuclear drop on target. firing of an Honest John missile is a dramatic highlight. The display of nuclear capability underscores the importance of the U.S. mission in Western Europe, where American firepower must remain alert for any military emergency. Greetings and Fosset from West Berlin on a festive occasion. Here at the U.S. Army Berlin Brigade sports field, American personnel invite Berliners to join them in a two-week celebration.
Each year, the Volksfest, the U.S. Army's largest community relations project in Berlin, recreates part of America's cultural heritage for Berliners to enjoy. The 1967 celebration is a tribute to historic St. Augustine, Florida, one of America's oldest cities. Both local and U.S. talent get a big play as performers of all ages offer a wide variety of entertainment. During the show, Berlin officials present testimonials to American officers. Drawing annual crowds of almost half a million people, the Volksfest is one of the most popular Berlin attractions. Now the bagpipers take over for a few bars of the Highland Plain, Berlin style. No doubt about this style, it's strictly USA. West German translation, Der Charleston. A broken arm doesn't stop this little lady from dancing up a storm. Next, a guitar trio. Dependents of our military personnel take part in the festivities. The Berlin Brigade Band gives out with some non-military background music for the acts. An international mood prevails as a Spanish dance is performed by the daughter of a member of the U.S. Brigade. This American soldier has the right idea. Nobody's going to step all over his feet, especially not that life-size doll he's chosen as a dancing partner. Among the many features of the entertainment program are contests involving audience participation. Contestants selected from the daily crowds at the Volksfest perform various stunts for prizes and applause. Better watch those fingers. Especially popular at the Volksfest is the performance by the Army drill team. Intricate arms and weapons drill maneuvers are demonstrated. The presentation is well received by Berliners, who each year learn more about Americans and life in the United States through the German-American Volksfest. Two twenty-eighth Helicopter Battalion, 21 September, 0600 hours. The beginning of a routine day. In the Vietnam War, that can take in a lot. My job, helicopter pilot. But like many of the pilots, I have additional duties within the battalion. As assistant adjutant, my morning starts off with some administrative work on personnel assignments. A call from operations to come over for a briefing on my assigned flight missions for the day. A brisk walk across our compound at Anke. The weather is fine. A great day for flying. B Company operations room. Our briefing officer fills me in on my flight plans. The 228th is assigned to support the U.S. Army 1st Cavalry Division Air Mobile in a large sweeping operation to clear out communist forces and terrorists from the Central Highlands. 
My assignment is airlift of supplies and equipment to various landing zones in the region. As often as I've flown this kind of mission, I still get a feeling of excitement at the start of another one. You never know what a day in the skies over Vietnam will bring. The big Chinook helicopter I'll be flying is ready and waiting to go. So are the crew members, a fine bunch. I've flown with them before. Each man is an expert at his job. A final checkup on flight plans and a last minute briefing for the crew. A last minute visual check of the aircraft is always in order. She looks in fine shape. Ten hundred hours, we take off. My gunner keeps a sharp eye on the jungle below. U.S. aircraft are fair game for VC attack whenever they can reach it. Helicopter operations require close communication with supporting units. I receive constant information as to enemy troop sightings and conditions at the landing sites ahead. At landing zone H, we pick up some vehicles needed in a forward area. The Chinook helicopter has a cabin 30 feet long and can handle cargo up to three tons. Load safely aboard and secure. We lose no time in getting underway. Next stop will be landing zone Y, where more cargo is awaiting pickup. An Army helicopter pilot in South Vietnam keeps an eye on the ground, on the lookout for Viet Cong activity. So far, it's been a quiet trip. Maybe it'll continue that way, and maybe it won't. 1,300 hours, landing zone Y. We unload the cargo. Then another pickup and take off in a hurry. Word has just reached me by radio that one of the first air cav fighting units up ahead is running very short on supplies. Fourteen twenty hours. We make the much needed delivery. Now it's time out for refueling, both the aircraft and the crew. We take on a load of rations, medical supplies, and mail for the next touchdown. A quick briefing by the liaison officer of the forward support element about the next leg of the trip. Then it's upstairs for a brief shuttle run to the next pickup zone. We're in mountain country. All hands look for trouble below. This central highlands region has been the scene of some of the heaviest fighting of the war. More of it is going on right now. 1,600 hours. Received word to make an unscheduled pickup en route. This time we take on a sling load of howitzer shells and powder for airlift to Zone C. The 1st Air Cav Brigade has located a big enemy concentration that has to be softened up. On this job, last minute pickups are par for the course. By the time we've got the cargo secured and underway, the afternoon's almost over. I don't like flying at night. But if it all adds up to helping our boys do a better job on the VC, that's enough for me.
One of the lesser known activities of the United States Army is the work of the combat artists who fill an important morale building role. Organized into various teams, these trained professionals move with our troops throughout the theaters of combat. Their purpose is to portray the military experience as seen in the sights and panoramas that face the soldier wherever his battle assignment may take him. Since our War of Independence, the story of America's fighting men, as pictured by artists, has been a treasured part of the nation's cultural heritage. Famous paintings of battles and military life hang in museums all over America. Often they have begun with a sketch pad and pencil in the hands of a combat artist on the scene with an eye for a good picture. On-the-spot sketches capture the immediate impressions of the artist. This Army specialist in Vietnam is enjoying a quiet sketching session. But often the combat artist may have to dodge bullets and shells to reach a spot from which he can vividly communicate the sights of battle. World Wars I and II and the Korean conflict produce dramatic and striking examples of the combat artist's skill. The war in Vietnam will be recalled similarly by many sketches and paintings in which the images of modern warfare will be permanently engraved. The combat artist travels by any means he can from one area of military activity to another. Seascape at Kamran Bay, where the U.S. Army carries on intensive logistical supply activities in support of our soldiers. At combat artist headquarters, the specialist teams working in all the media of their art record the history-making assignment of our army in Vietnam. <laughs> U.S. combat artists work at their craft so that Americans back home today and in the future may experience in vivid imagery the service and sacrifice of our fighting men. For days, men of the U.S. Army 25th Infantry Division have moved cautiously through the jungles of Quang Nai Province in Vietnam. Concealed in these lowlands are members of the Viet Cong and guerrilla fighters from the Communist People's Army. Our objective, clear them out of the area. The going is rough for the men of the 25th. Streams, swamps, and muddy terrain impede the operation. A sampan is discovered and searched. The infantrymen move into a village. It could be a friendly one, or every doorway could be booby-trapped, and every nearby tree could conceal a VC sniper. The villagers appear frightened. Through interpreters, they tell the soldiers the Viet Cong have been there, stolen food, and run away at the approach of the U.S. forces. Often, the VC will mingle with the peasants, making it difficult to distinguish between friend and foe. During the late afternoon, the search continues. As yet, there has been no contact with the enemy. On the approach to another village, there are indications that this is VC territory. A shot rings out. The order is given to hit the dirt and open fire. Sniper fire may come from anywhere, trees, bushes, tunnel entrances. Our troops lob in grenades to flush out the snipers. Pretty soon the gunfire stops and the search continues. The men keep on the alert for new attacks, for hidden VC traps and other delaying devices. 
after the area has been cleared, a call is put in for helicopters to pick up the men and return them to camp. While waiting for the airlift back, a rice cache hidden by the Viet Cong is discovered. Enemy resistance is usually strong whenever Allied forces near VC food supplies, but our men manage to move out the rice without incident. The choppers come in for the pickup, a welcome sight to the members of the search mission. much of which has been stolen from South Vietnamese villagers, is loaded aboard for return to the people. Now the men load up. And it's liftoff. Back at base camp, the 3rd Brigade of the 25th Infantry Division commemorates its 365th consecutive day in combat. During the preceding year, the unit has captured 2,400 North Vietnamese soldiers and an equal number of Viet Cong. It has fought in seven major military operations. On hand for the ceremonies is the then Major General William B. Rossum. He commends the troops for their military successes. General Rossum says, one cannot stand facing the colors of this brigade without experiencing great pride. A distinguished moment for U.S. combat soldiers in Vietnam who serve the cause of freedom. On Easter Sunday, as on every Sunday of the year, Chaplain Holland Hope, one of the three flying chaplains of the 2nd Field Force, takes to the air to carry his portable church services to isolated special forces camps in the 3rd and 4th Corps areas in Vietnam. Carrying his portable altar and a battery-powered tape recorder with pre-recorded hymns on it, Colonel Hope is warmly greeted at the special forces camps. He moves into the camp's mess hall and sets up his altar. Before the services, he passes out some magazines he has managed to bring along with him. His services are more an informal presentation. For here, all that really matters is that these men have the privilege to worship in their own way with the chaplain. If you'll uh, bow your head, we'll begin with a word of prayer. And then we have a hymn. I think all of us have hymnals. All right. Everyone ready? Let us pray. Almighty God, our Father, we're grateful to thee for this day and the comforts and blessings we have received at thy holy hand. We're grateful for our fellowship together and this opportunity of worship. And we pray that during this holy season of Lent, we may prepare our minds and our hearts for the Easter service. We pray that thou will be with us today with the guidance of thy Holy Spirit, that we may honor thy name, warm our hearts, and enlighten our minds. Through Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. today that I'd like to share with you and for us to study is from the fourth chapter of Galatians, the first seven verses. But I say that so long as the heir is a child, he differeth nothing from a bondservant, though he is lord of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the day appointed of the father. So we also, when we were children, were held in bondage under the rudiments of the world. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, that he might redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. 
so that thou art no longer a bondservant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Father, we're grateful for this privilege of joining together in worship to thee. Wilt thou be with us now and keep us in thy care, and as we go from this place, may we be joined yet together in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. These things we pray and give thee thanks through Christ our Lord. Amen. Can I say a prayer? Yes, please do. I want to take this time, O oh Heavenly Father, to thank thee for bringing the chaplain to this location, helping us, O oh Heavenly Father, to reaffirm our faith in thee. We know, O oh Heavenly Father, especially here at this site, that thy presence is a must. We know, O oh Heavenly Father, especially in the past few days, we have seen thy goodness and thy mercy here at this site. We ask thee, O oh Heavenly Father, to bless us to forgive us for our sins. We know, O God, that as long as two or three are gathered here in thy name, we know that thy will be present. We know, O Heavenly Father, that as long as we have thee, as long as we know that thou art with us, we have nothing to fear. We ask thee to bless our loved ones, and especially the members of this detachment, O God. All these things we ask in thy name. Amen. Amen. Colonel Hope has stated that despite their position in this war, the men have a strong appreciation of their religion. It is with this thought in mind that the Air Mobile Chaplains of the Second Field Force bring religious services to the remote Special Forces camps in Vietnam.